From New York, this is Democracy Now! With sadness, I am announcing that I will be resigning from the position of governor, effective on Friday, August 2nd, 2019, at 5 in the afternoon. Of Puerto Rico, Ricardo Rosselló has resigned following 12 days of mass protests. The demonstrations began after the publication of shocking, misogynistic, and homophobic text messages between Rosselló, staffers, and advisors. Some mocked victims of Hurricane Maria. We'll get the latest. Then to Robert Mueller's testimony on Capitol Hill. And what about total exoneration? Did you actually totally exonerate the president? No. And your investigation actually found, quote, multiple acts by the president that were capable of exerting undue influence over law enforcement investigations, including the Russian interference and obstruction investigations. Is that correct? Correct. And we go to London, where Britain's new prime minister, Boris Johnson, is vowing to leave the European Union within 99 days. We have a momentous task ahead of us, uh, at a pivotal moment in our country's history. We are now committed, all of us, to leaving the European Union on October the 31st, or indeed earlier. No ifs, no buts. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Puerto Rico's Governor Ricardo Rosselló announced Wednesday he'll resign from office less than two weeks after the release of shocking text messages showing the governor and his aides mocking victims of Hurricane Maria, joking about shooting San Juan's mayor, and using language laced with misogyny, homophobia, profanity and violence. Rosselló's resignation sparked celebrations that lasted through the night, capping 12 days of massive protests calling for his ouster. Speaking in a recorded video that was streamed live on Facebook hours after he quietly left the governor's mansion, Rosselló said he would formally step down on Friday, August 2nd, and he named his successor. The person who will assume the weight of the office, who will have the privilege to occupy it, will need the support of the people and for each person to work tirelessly for democracy. At this time, in accordance with the legal framework, this person will be the current secretary of the Department of Justice, Wanda Vasquez. Wanda Vasquez is an appointee of Governor Rosselló. Calls for her immediate resignation are already flooding social media. After headlines, we'll have more in Puerto Rico with journalist Ed Morales, author of the forthcoming book Fantasy Island, Colonialism, Exploitation and the Betrayal of Puerto Rico. President Trump's vetoed three congressional resolutions halting the planned sales of weapons to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Wednesday's vetoes came a week after the House of Representatives voted to block Trump's move to sidestep Congress by allowing the sale of $8 billion worth of Raytheon precision-guided weapon systems. Similar weapons have been used to target civilians in the Saudi-led war in Yemen, which has sparked the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. Opponents of the sales also point to Saudi Arabia's gross human rights abuses and the murder and dismemberment of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi at a Saudi consulate in Turkey last year. Congress does not appear to have the two-thirds majority needed to override Trump's vetoes. Special Counsel Robert Mueller testified on Capitol Hill Wednesday for the first time about his investigation into Russian interference in the 2006 16 presidential elections. Over seven hours of hearings, Mueller stressed to the House Judiciary and Intelligence Committees that despite Donald Trump's claims, he had not exonerated the president of obstruction of justice. This is House Judiciary Chair Gerald Nadler questioning Mueller. So the report did not conclude that he did not commit obstruction of justice. Is that correct? That is correct. And what about total exoneration? Did you actually totally exonerate the president? No. Now, in fact, your report expressly states that it does not exonerate the president. It does. We'll have more on Robert Mueller's congressional testimony later in the broadcast with Ryan Grimm, D.C. bureau chief for The Intercept. A federal court in California has blocked President Trump's ban on most asylum seekers seeking refuge at the U.S.-Mexico border. The preliminary injunction came just hours after a federal judge in Washington, D.C., let the rules stand in a separate challenge. But following the ruling in U.S. District Court in San Francisco, the Trump administration will be required to continue accepting asylum claims, at least for now. Trump's rules seek 
seeks to bar anyone who passes through a third country from exercising their right under international law to seek asylum in the U.S., including at the southern border with Mexico. Bahar Azmi, the legal director for the Center for Constitutional Rights, who helped challenge Trump's asylum policy, said, quote, the court correctly decided that decades of U.S. asylum law prevent this administration from attempting to deny wholesale asylum protections to the arbitrary and hasty regulation. This application of the law will also save lives of vulnerable refugees fleeing for their lives and safety, he said. Federal regulators have ordered Facebook to pay a $5 billion fine for massive breaches in privacy that saw tens of millions of users' data used without their consent. It's the largest fine for a privacy breach in U.S. history, but critics say the $5 billion penalty is far too lenient for a company valued at $580 billion. After the settlement was announced, shares of Facebook rose on the Nasdaq stock exchange by more than a percentage point, and the company reported nearly $17 billion in revenue for the three months ending in June. In the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson has been sworn in as prime minister, pledging to deliver a swift Brexit and spending his first full day in office packing his cabinet with hardline Brexiteers. Speaking outside 10 Downing Street in London, Johnson raised the prospect of a so-called hard Brexit, dismissing the concerns of many who predict a no-deal withdrawal from the European Union would be a disaster for the British economy. And to all those who continue to prophesy disaster. I say, yes, there will be difficulties, though I believe that with energy and application, they will be far less serious than some have claimed. Johnson's first day as prime minister was marked by massive street protests. Thousands marched through central London despite a scorching heat wave. An activist from Greenpeace briefly blocked the new prime minister from reaching Buckingham Palace to meet with the Queen by forming a human chain in the path of his motorcade. The demonstration was quickly dispersed by police. Later in the broadcast, we'll go to London to speak with Ash Sarkar, who was in the streets at yesterday's protests. North Korea fired two short-range missiles into the Sea of Japan early Thursday, the first such test since early May. South Korean military officials said one of the two missiles tested appeared to be a new design. The test came as the Pentagon continued preparation for joint war games with South Korea's military, scheduled for next month, and weeks after President Trump held a surprise trip to meet with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un at the demilitarized zone separating the North and South, where Trump pledged to restart denuclearization talks. The House of Representatives has passed a bill opposing the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, or BDS movement, a global solidarity campaign with the Palestinian people. The nonviolent movement seeks to use economic and cultural pressure to force Israel to end its occupation of Palestinian lands. Tuesday's vote of 398 to 17 saw just one Republican and 16 Democrats oppose the resolution. One of them was Michigan Representative Rashida Tlaib, who in November became the first Palestinian-American woman elected to Congress. I stand before you, the daughter of Palestinian immigrants, parents who experience being stripped of their human rights, the right to freedom of travel, equal treatment. So I can't stand by and watch this attack on our freedom of speech and the right to boycott the racist policies of the government and the state of Israel. The House resolution passed just days after hundreds of Israeli troops demolished Palestinian homes in a village at the West Bank East Jerusalem border, clearing the way for Israel to build more illegal settlements. International observers have said the demolitions amount to a war crime. Chinese military leaders signaled Wednesday they're prepared to intervene against pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong. This is Wu Tsien, spokesman for China's Mil Ministry of National Defense. The behavior of some extreme protesters have challenged the authorities of the central government, tested the limits of the one country, two systems principles, which are absolutely intolerable. We will not allow the pearl of the East to be stained. The threat came just days after Hong Kong police fired tear gas and rubber bullets at protesters who once again took to the streets calling for pro-democracy reforms and for an investigation into police abuses during earlier protests. In Mozambique, the World Food Program is warning some 1.6 million people are facing food insecurity, months after two cyclones left hundreds dead in one of the worst weather-related disasters ever to hit the southern hemisphere. Meanwhile, much of Europe is being hit by a massive heat wave, sending temperatures into record-setting and life-threatening terrain for parts of the continent. 
Temperatures were forecast to reach 104 degrees Fahrenheit in many German cities, with highs in Paris expected to top 107 degrees. It's the second major heat wave this year in Europe, where many countries recorded their highest ever temperatures just one month ago. This comes as new research published in the journal Science finds the climate is changing faster and over a wider area of the Earth than at any other time in the last 2,000 years. The current rate of change far outpaces climate variations seen centuries ago during events like the medieval warm period on the Little Ice Age. Former vice president and 2020 presidential contender Joe Biden Wednesday defended his support for the 1994 crime bill, which imposed mandatory minimum sentences on nonviolent offenders, directed billions of dollars toward prison construction, and led the United States to become the world's largest mass incarcerator. Biden's defense of the law, which he co-authored while serving as a senator from Delaware, came as the annual convention of the NAACP wrapped up in Detroit. 1994 crime bill, we had a gigantic epidemic in America of violence, particularly in African-American communities. Now, Jesse and I disagreed a little bit in this, but in my community, the notion was was overwhelmingly supported. Biden was referring to comments by the civil rights leader, Reverend Jesse Jackson, who said Biden Wednesday had some obligation to address the 1994 crime bill. On Tuesday, Biden rolled out his criminal justice reform proposal, which would reverse many of the provisions of the 94 crime bill he helped author. Another presidential candidate appearing at the NAACP's convention, New York, New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, took aim at Biden's proposal. For a guy who helped to be an architect of mass incarceration, this is an inadequate uh, solution to what is a raging crisis in our country. And in Pennsylvania, an appeals court has thrown out a guilty verdict against the popular rapper Meek Mill, who was convicted in a non-jury trial in 2008 on drugs and weapons charges based on the false testimony of his arresting officer. Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, led by Larry Krasner, supported Mill's bid to have the conviction overturned. Krasner's office has not yet said whether prosecutors will proceed with a retrial. The conviction has dogged Mill ever since his conviction 11 years ago, keeping him on probation for over a decade. This is Meek Mill speaking in a video released on Twitter this week. I've been on probation, I think, like 10 or 11 years. I can't really count no more probation. Like, who made these policies up try to keep people like me down? Like, damn, straight to prison, straight to handcuffs, straight to a five-by-nine cell with a metal toilet seat. Meek Mill's jailing sparked widespread calls for his freedom, including from Jay-Z, Colin Kaepernick, and activists across Philadelphia. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin today's show in Puerto Rico. Celebrations were held throughout the night in Puerto Rico after Governor Ricardo Rosello announced he would resign following 12 days of massive protests. The demonstrations began after Puerto Rico's Center for Investigative Journalism published close to 900 pages of text messages between Rosello, staffers and advisors. The group chat messages were riddled with misogyny, homophobia, profanity and violence. Some of the messages mocked victims of Hurricane Maria and joked about shooting San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulin Cruz. Throughout the day Wednesday, Puerto Rico was on edge over whether Rocio would resign. Thousands of protesters had gathered outside the governor's mansion, Fortaleza. The Puerto Rican legislature threatened to impeach Rocio if he did not step down. But until just before midnight, there was no news. Then, Rosseo posted a pre-recorded video message on Facebook. A pesar de contar con el mandato del pueblo que democráticamente me eligió. Despite having the mandate of the people who democratically elected me, today I feel that to continue in this position represents a difficulty for the success of the country. After listening to the demands, speaking to my family, thinking about my children and prayer, I have made the following decision. With sadness, I am announcing that I will be resigning from the position of governor, effective on Friday, August 2nd, 2019, at 5 in the afternoon. In these coming days, I will be attending to pending issues to facilitate an orderly transition. 
The person who will assume the weight of the office, who will have the privilege to occupy it, will need the support of the people and for each person to work tirelessly for democracy. At this time, in accordance with the legal framework, this person will be the current secretary of the Department of Justice, Wanda Vasquez. I am confident that Puerto Rico will continue united and move forward as it has always done. I hope that this decision serves as a call for the reconciliation of the people, which is what we need to continue moving forward for the well-being of Puerto Rico. The Facebook video was broadcast just before midnight throughout the area as thousands cheered when they watched it. The governor had quietly left the mansion a few hours before. Celebrations broke out across San Juan. Many stayed in the streets late into the night. It's completely fair, late, but he finally did it. We are celebrating. We are super happy. The people can do it when they unite. They can. Ricky is leaving not just for all the obscenities and insults on chat, but also for corruption. Good that he is going. To talk more about Puerto Rico, we're joined by longtime journalist Ed Morales, author of the forthcoming book Fantasy Island, Colonialism, Exploitation and the Betrayal of Puerto Rico. Um, well, you look tired. I think you were probably up through the night. Right around midnight, this announcement came. And no one knew whether the governor was going to come out and speak or what he would do at that point, apparently uh, breaching some agreement he had made with the legislature that he would speak before 5. They were going to begin impeachment hearings, they said, today at 2. The significance of the governor of Puerto Rico resigning, again, effective next Friday, August 2nd, Ed. Well, I think there are two really important uh, levels of significance. First, it represents a uh, victory for the people of uh, Puerto Rico, which is extremely important. Uh, you know, it's an intersectional coalition of uh, people who uh, have fused somehow identity politics and uh, class conflict struggle. So um, that is really important for Puerto Rico moving forward. But on the other hand, it also represents a real weakening of the Puerto Rican government. Um, there are all of these cabinet positions to uh, be filled. Um, even the Judge Taylor Swain, who oversees the bankruptcy proceedings in the Promesa Court, has suspended uh, all activity for 90 days because she wants to see how things settle down. And, you know, uh, it's also, you know, as much as uh, we dislike what was going on with uh, Rosseo, it's uh, it's a difficult moment that the the government, which is basically you know the the vessel for democracy in Puerto Rico, is right now staggering, and there's a fiscal oversight and management board that is poised to take more control. Well, could you give us some background? I mean, the the reasons, the many reasons for the opposition to to Rosselló, which preceded uh, these uh, uh, text messages, the revelation of these text messages. Yeah, well, about two weeks before the text messages came out, um, his uh, secretary of finance, uh, Raul Maldonado, resigned. And then he gave an interview to El Nuevo Dia, the newspaper that said that there was uh, institutional uh, corruption. And uh, then after that, his son came out and said that he had this stuff on, uh, on the governor and that he was going to be something was going to happen soon. You know, we don't know who the source was for uh, releasing the chats. I think it's interesting to take a look at the fact that uh, Raul Maldonado was, had already been cooperating with the FBI, and these revelations by his son, who's supposed to be a tech guy, you know, then two weeks later result in the release of these chats. Um, the, also, uh, Julia Kelleher, the Secretary of Education and the Secretary of uh, Health Insurance, in charge of health insurance, were also arrested uh, by a Department of Justice uh, operation. So, you know— And the significance yeah. of Kelleher. Well, <coughs> who I mean, actually made more money yeah. than um, B Betsy DeVos, mm -hmm. the federal right. secretary of education, though, of course, doesn't have anything like her yeah. wealth. She was dead, you know, uh, she was hell bent on uh, doing massive privatization of schools. She closed many schools, um, but she was involved in these uh, plans of granting contracts, which is endemic to the whole uh, administration, uh, this uh, pay for play stuff and uh, taking contracts that uh, did not go through a fair uh, request for proposal procedure. So, I mean, there's an enormous amount. You know, there are also two major figures, Elias Sanchez, who is this mysterious uh, lobbyist and uh, consultant who was in on the chats, and that 
uh, possibly violated law because he was not contracted by the government and he was in on all these government uh, maneuverings, which were being done in the chat. And this other guy, Edwin Miranda, uh, who was a huge public relations figure in uh, Puerto Rico. And can you talk about, you mentioned earlier, the Fiscal Control Board. What do you anticipate happening now? Well, um, you know, since the uh, the bankruptcy uh, procedure uh, is temporarily, uh, you know, it's a pseudo bankruptcy procedure is temporarily suspended. Um, the the fiscal oversight and management board is, uh, I guess, waiting to see who they're going to be working with. Because another thing about Rosario leaving is not only is he not. Uh, advocating for uh, Puerto Rico uh, from his office, but also his non-voting representative, Christian Sobrino, also had to quit. He made the most offensive uh, chat reference, the one uh, talking about uh, cadavers and vultures going to eat them. Um, so there's absolutely, there's, you know, the thing is there's no uh, Puerto Rico government involvement right now with the Fiscal Oversight and Management Board. So um, there's no one to talk about the next uh, economic plan. They have to fill out the entire government to be able to resume uh, these kind of activities. And, uh, you know, the, the government, you know, one of the reasons this happened is because the government had been put in this position of having almost no power because of the Fiscal Oversight and Management Board. They could suggest economic plans, but they ultimately had to be approved by the economic, uh, by the uh, Fiscal Oversight and Management Board, La Junta. And they often sort of fought back in this sort of uh, theatrical way that was, uh, you know, uh, didn't make any sense. It was they were just playing a role, which I think you can see a lot in the chats, too. They thought the whole thing was a joke. They would fight back and say, no, we're not going to cut the pensions. In fact, they were advocating for not cutting the pensions. But in the end, they'd always give in to the Fiscal Oversight and Management Board. And the so vulture capitalists who profited off of the hurricane and the money that came in, the money not actually going to the victims of Hurricane Maria, the frustration of the right. people before. Of course, this didn't start 12 days ago. Perhaps the mass visual manifestation of the protests yes. of the thousands and then hundreds of thousands. There were many protesting, even in the streets before, and even those who didn't, the terrific pain and discontent in Puerto Rico. Yeah. I would say you had a hard core of uh, demonstrators that go back to 2010, 2011, uh, when uh, Fortunio, who was the first governor who tried to implement austerity uh, measures, was really pushed back against by university students and uh, labor unions. That formed a kind of a hard core of resistance in Puerto Rico. And then, uh, yes, the emotional weight of dealing with the hurricane and uh, not having electricity for months and not being able to take a shower and uh, worrying about your loved ones and worrying, having the demoralizing feeling that everyone wanted to leave, um, really, uh, it, it came out in a burst of emotion. That was the, 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 the huge amount of people who joined this core of resistance, some of which was formed by people who were in this uh, group called Victoria Ciudadana, which uh, is, uh, uh, the major figures are Rafael Bernabe, who you had here before, and Alexandra Lugaro, and um, Manuel Natal, who has done a lot of—he's a state representative who had done a lot of investigative uh, research about both the Elias Sanchez and the uh, Edwin Miranda scandal. These people are advocating for a new politics in Puerto Rico that isn't just concerned with status, but wants to really deal with— Status uh, being common with right. statehood or independence. Exactly. New forms of making democracy, new kinds of politics for Puerto Rico, and they might emerge in the 2020 election. And who do you think uh, is likely to succeed, uh, uh, Rosselló? I mean, a number of the issues that you point out are, of course, structural, ongoing issues. So whoever succeeds him will also confront the same. Yes. Um, well, you know, that's a big battle. You know, I mean, uh, Wanda Vasquez, who is the secretary of Justicia of Justice, um, she is in the succession for, uh, you know, in the, according to the Constitution, who will uh, become governor. However— Because the secretary of state resigned already last right. week. Mm -hmm. But since Rosseo said he would be leaving at 5 p.m. on August 2nd, and I doubt he's going to make it by 5 p.m., considering all the lateness that's been happening— um, 
There is a lot of speculation that he will be naming the Secretary of State, which is actually head of the Secretary of Justice, um, and that person will be. So he would appoint that person, and then they would become right. the governor. Right. Already in social media, it was a f uh, Twitter yeah. last night uh, with calls for Juan de Vesquez to resign right. again, also an appointee of right. Rosillo. Yeah. This dangerous moment in Puerto Rico, both an incredible opportunity, right. but you know, when you have a moment like this, the question is, as the all the powers realign, who comes forward? Our colleague, Democracy Now!'s Juan Gonzalez, yesterday was raising this issue in times right. of regime change. Naomi Klein has written extensively about disaster capitalism right. and who moves in. Uh, you've written about the intersectionality of the protests. You've talked about the importance of the different movements um, that have come together to force out the governor. But what do you think about that? And especially going back to the issue of the vulture capitalists have to be positioned themselves right now. Yes. Well, yes, it's it's dangerous. And yesterday, actually, uh, Jennifer Gonzalez, who is the pro-Trump uh, resident commissioner, uh, announced that she and Sean Duffy, who's one of the architects of Promesa, and uh, I think one of the uh, senators from uh, I forget, um, they are uh, considering uh, asking Trump to name a kind of uh, government fund czar. Which I think, to me, it harkens back to the days of uh, military appointed military governors in Puerto Rico. Um, this czar would probably have the ultimate power, even maybe even over the. Uh, it's actually an interesting fight between um, the executive branch and Congress, <laughs> because Congress controls most of the affairs of Puerto Rico, and uh, it, uh, the Promesa Act and the Oversight Board is a creation of Congress. So all of that is very threatening. But I do think that the people of Puerto Rico are really, uh, you know, they're they're together now, and they're and they're intent. There's going to be another march today. They're they're trying to show that they are united, and it's going to be an interesting thing to see what happens with this people power. Well, we want to thank you so much, Ed Morales, for joining us. Longtime journalist, author of the forthcoming book Fantasy Island: Colonialism, Exploitation, and the Betrayal of Puerto Rico. We hope to have you back when it comes Thanks. out in mid-September. When we come back from break, we look at Robert M Mueller's testimony on Capitol Hill with Ryan Grimm of The Intercept. Stay with us. En mi viejo San Juan. Cuántos sueños forjé en mis años de infancia. Mi primera ilusión y mis fuitas de amor son recuerdos del alma. Una tarde me fui hacia extraña nación, pues lo que hizo el destino. Mi corazón se quedó frente al mar en mi viejo San Juan. Adiós. In My Old San Juan by Jose Feliciano, the Puerto Rican musician. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermin Sheikh. Democrats are vowing to continue their probes into President Trump following former special counsel Robert Mueller's testimony on Wednesday, but efforts to impeach the president appear to be fading. Mueller spent seven hours testifying before the House Judiciary and Intelligence Committees about his report on Russian interference in the 2016 election. But the former FBI director offered little new information about his two-year investigation and refused to answer scores of questions from both Democrats and Republicans. He answered many other questions with just single words. During the hearing, Robert Mueller rejected Trump's claim the probe was a witch hunt, warned Russia still actively trying to interfere in U.S. elections, and refused to exonerate President Trump of obstruction of justice. During his opening statement, Mueller laid out some key findings of his report. First, our investigation found that the Russian government interfered in our election in sweeping and systematic fashion. Second, the investigation did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired with the Russian government in its election interference activities. We did not address collusion, which is not a legal term. Rather, we focused on whether the evidence was sufficient 
to charge any member of the campaign with taking part in a criminal conspiracy, and it was not. House Judiciary Chairman Jared Nadler began the questioning of Robert Mueller at Wednesday's hearing. Director Mueller, the president has repeatedly claimed that your report found there was no obstruction and that it completely and totally exonerated him. But that is not what your report said, is it? Correct. It is not what the report said. And now, reading from page two of volume two of your report that's on the screen, you wrote, quote, if we had confidence after a thorough investigation of the facts that the president clearly did not commit obstruction of justice, we would so state. Based on the facts and the applicable legal standards, however, we are unable to reach that judgment, close quote. Now, does that say there was no obstruction? No. And what about total exoneration? Did you actually totally exonerate the president? No. Now, in fact, your report expressly states that it does not exonerate the president. It does. And your investigation actually found, quote, multiple acts by the president that were capable of exerting undue influence over law enforcement investigations, including the Russian interference and obstruction investigations. Is that correct? Correct. Robert Mueller responding to a question from House Judiciary Chair Gerald Nadler. From where we go to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by Ryan Grimm, the D.C. bureau chief for The Intercept, author of the new book, We've Got People, from Jesse Jackson to Alexandra Casio-Cortez, The End of Big Money and the Rise of Movement. Ryan, welcome back to Democracy Now! Uh, your reaction to what took place yesterday in Washington, D.C., the Democrats putting all their eggs in the Mueller basket, uh, was Miller time, everything it was hyped up to be. Well, it, it was strange theater because it was undercut the entire time by this really aggressive insistence by House Democratic leadership and, and, and specifically by Speaker Nancy Pelosi that the party not pursue impeachment proceedings. And so the entire time you're kind of watching this unfold, you know in the back of your mind that, well, the the party leadership doesn't want to impeach the president. So what, what exactly is going on here? What kind of what is the point almost of what we're being told here? Why why are we going back through the Mueller report? You know, if it's not leading toward some type of Im impeachment proceedings, because if you read the you know the second volume of of the Mueller report, uh, his efforts to obstruct the investigation and his lack of respect for the rule of law that underlied that effort. Are, are extraordinary. Like he, you know, it, it, he's, you know, th this is somebody who has a dangerous disregard uh, for the rule of law, and that's quite patent, you know, in the Mueller report, and it comes through in, in Mueller's testimony. Yet at the same time, Democrats don't want to move forward with impeachment proceedings. So, it, so it leaves a viewer quite confused about what's actually trying to unfold here. So what do you think was the Democratic strategy and the Republican strategy in the kind of questioning they put forward? And your response to the fact that he, uh, uh, Mueller, evaded or uh, answered very briefly almost 200 questions? So the, my sense of the, the broader strategy, and I think I've even said that this on this program several months ago, that, that Pelosi kind of wants to, to run out the clock on on, on this two-year cycle. So, you know, or, or, you know they, they could have moved for Trump's tax returns, you know, as, as soon as they uh, won power in the House of Representatives, for instance. They delayed doing that until just now. And the congressional uh, clock has, has a way of speeding up as it gets closer to the summer. And so, you know, we're, we're very close now to the August recess. And to people who live and work in Capitol Hill, the, the first August recess in some ways represents kind of the end of the, the legislative session, because when they come back for September, they'll just have a, a couple of weeks, then they've got Thanksgiving, then they've got Christmas, and then all of a sudden uh, people are going to the caucuses in Iowa. And so the, the entire next year is taken up by a presidential election. So it seemed like the broad strategy was to kind of just, uh, you know, slow walk this into uh, the presidential campaign because Democrats felt like they were kind of ahead, you know, that, that, that Trump was on his heels and that if they, if they pushed too far, if they overreached, there would be a backlash against them. So better, better to just uh, sit and do nothing 
and kind of uh, let the next election <laughs> come to them. But that, that, that hasn't unfolded, I think, as well as Democrats had hoped it would. I want to go to California Democratic Congress member Ted Lieu, questioning former special counsel Robert Mueller. So to recap what we've heard, uh, we have heard today that the president ordered former White House counsel Don Morgan to fire you. The president ordered Don Morgan to then cover that up and create a false paper trail. And now we've heard the president ordered Corey Lewandowski to tell Jeff Sessions to limit your investigation so that he, you, stop investigating the president. I believe a reasonable person looking at these facts uh, could conclude that all three elements of the crime of obstruction justice have been met. And I'd like to ask you, the reason, again, that you did not indict Donald Trump is because of OLC opinion stating that you cannot indict a sitting president, correct? Uh, that is correct. So, a few hours later, in the second of the day's hearings, Mueller sought to correct the record. I want to go back to one thing that was said this morning by Mr. Liu who said, and I quote, you didn't charge the president because of the OLC opinion. That is not the correct way to say it. As we say in the report, and as I said at the opening, we did not reach a determination as to whether the president committed a crime. So explain the significance of this, Ryan Grimm. All right. And I think it was Slate that uh, described this back and forth uh, as kind of a metaphor for the entire Mueller proceedings, where you have a a huge explosive moment where uh, Mueller essentially says, yes, I agree that he met the elements of the crime of obstruction of justice, and I would have charged him, but for the OLC opinion that says that you cannot charge a sitting president. You know, that's, that's an explosive allegation coming from Mueller saying, no, he, we, we, found, uh, we found evidence that we could have indicted him, but we didn't because you can't indict a president. And so, for an hour or so, uh, the Democrats are, are kind of celebrating that announcement from him. Then he comes before the next committee and says, well, let me clarify that. And this, this happened over and over over the last year and a half. Let me clarify that. Uh, we actually didn't come to a determination over whether or not we could charge him, even before uh, they get to the OLC opinion. It seemed like OLC what he was being saying Office was that of even, legal counsel. Right. And it seemed like what he was saying is that even if we had gotten uh, to the to the place where we decided we could have charged him, you know, then we wouldn't have. But we didn't get to we didn't get to that place. There was contemporaneous reporting that there were prosecutors inside Mueller's team uh, who disagreed on the, on this question. There were some that thought the the elements were absolutely there, and there were others who said that they 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 weren't quite there, and that there could be kind of reasonable uh, alternative explanations for for Trump's behavior. I think a, a viewer can make their own judgment on this, because that's the other thing that's so interesting about this, is that you have members of Congress and you have Mueller not only talking uh, about a report that is public, but talking about behavior that, that significantly was carried out in public or was reported on in real time. You know, the New York Times reported that Trump uh, ordered McGahn uh, to fire uh, to fire. Uh, Mueller, you know this, this. This was known before the the report came out, uh, as as was as was a lot of this. And it was, it, you know, it's it's also kind of indisputable that he asked McGahn to cover up the fact that he that he tried to fire Mueller. Uh, you know, the other elements are fairly easily met. Did he have intent to uh, uh, subvert the investigation? Did he know there was an investigation underway? Yes and yes. So all the elements. I, I'm not a lawyer. All the elements seem pretty obviously to be there, but there were some people inside the Mueller team who didn't believe it was there. And, and so uh, Mueller then had to come out and, and clarify that, well, actually, we didn't reach a full determination that we could have in, indicted him for this. Well, let's go back uh, to the hearing. This is Republican Ken Buck of Colorado questioning Mueller. But the, uh, could you charge the president with a crime after he left office? Yes. You believe that he committed, you could charge the president of the United States with obstruction of justice after he left office? Yes. Uh, ethically, under the ethical standards? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain because I haven't looked at the ethical standards, but the OLC opinion, opinion says that uh, the prosecutor, while he cannot bring a charge against a sitting president, nonetheless, he can continue the investigation to see if there are any uh, other uh, persons who might be drawn into the conspiracy. So, Ryan Grimm, your response to that, charging uh, Trump after uh, uh, he leaves office for obstruction of justice. And this is another 
uh, Rorschach test for the, the Mueller investigation. What, what Mueller appears to be answering is, does the OLC opinion al allow a prosecutor to charge a president, uh, charge the president, uh, after uh, he leaves office? And, and, and Mueller says yes. And then Mueller specifically says later he's referring to the findings of the, the Office of Legal Counsel opinion. And that, that's just a statement of fact. If a president commits a crime and prosecutors have evidence of that crime, then uh, the, then the prosecutor can charge the president after he leaves office. Uh, there were people that were hoping that what he meant was that we had the elements of the crime and we're, and we're just waiting until he leaves office and then we can charge him. Uh, and, it, and at one point, Buck kind of says, refers to Trump, but then he cuts himself off and refers back in general uh, to, a, to, a, to a vague president. Uh, and so it, it again leaves people uh, uh, leaves it open to interpretation of, of where you think he's heading. But if if Mueller had said otherwise that they they didn't conclude that they could charge him before they even got to the OLC opinion, then it seems clear he's talking in general terms. And of course, you know, once a president leaves office, they can be charged. That's why Ford pardoned Nixon so that he he wouldn't be charged after after he left office. So. You know, it, it's either a bombshell or it's just an obvious reading of the law. Well, let's go to Trump giving his response to the Mueller hearing. So we had a very good day today, the Republican Party, our country. There was no defense of what Robert Mueller was trying to defend, in all fairness to Robert Mueller, whether his performance was a bad one or a good one. I think everybody understands that. I think everybody understands what's going on. There was no defense to this ridiculous hoax, this witch hunt that's been going on for a long time. So Trump was on his way uh, to a campaign rally in West Virginia. Could you respond, Ryan, to what he said? He also said in the same statement that the uh, uh, hearing proved that the Democratic Party is essentially in ruins and that nothing was added to the report itself in uh, from the hearing, the seven-hour hearing. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't think of anything that was added uh, that, that we didn't already know. Uh, and and Democrats may have been hoping, and Democrats were hoping, uh, that Mueller would say that he believed that Trump should be impeached, uh, he, he, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't touch that question. He wouldn't even say, uh, when he was asked, when you said earlier uh, that, that congressional action or there should be other venues uh, for this investigation to be uh, carried out further, you know, what were you referring to? He wouldn't, he wouldn't even get into that. So, uh, not, so they couldn't get him to speculate further about about impeachment, and there weren't a whole lot of new facts that came out. There, there, he just he merely confirmed kind of what was in the report, and so I believe for Trump, he feels like uh, every piece of this that he puts behind him uh, is is a win for him. Uh, you know, this was the thing that he thought was going to end his presidency. I know it, it it dogged him for almost uh, you know two years or more than more than two years now, uh, and you know. If it hasn't killed him, he believes that it has made him stronger. And he said, of course, that uh, that Mueller was faltering, that he was, um, uh, you know, tripping, uh, not remembering a lot of the report, because it wasn't based on something over the last two years, he said. But, Ryan Grimm, I wanted to end with Puerto Rico. Um, we just see the uh, Puerto Rican governor has announced that he is resigning because of mass protests for almost two weeks. You, though, uh, in your book, um, first revealed an interesting aspect of what's taking place in Puerto Rico, um, fitting it into democratic politics in the United States. Uh, when you said that Tom Perez, uh, head of the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, actually won his position based on a deal he made with Puerto Rican Republicans. Can you explain? Yeah. Well, the, the island's partisan politics are extraordinarily scrambled, and Republican and Democrat don't mean the same thing there uh, as, as they do here. And, and, and the parties are more uh, divided along, uh, you know, uh, statehood or, or, or not statehood, but they still have the basic apparatuses of, of party structures, and so they have delegates to the Democratic National Committee. Uh, this band of statehooders, uh, mostly Republicans, pulled off a coup where they put a tiny announcement in a newspaper that there was going to be a DNC meeting, which satisfied the requirements for a quorum. 
They all showed up. None of the previous DNC people showed up. And they all elected themselves, mostly Republicans, statehooders, uh, to be the DNC delegates. So then they reached out to Tom Perez and said, look, if you, if you, if you come out for statehood at some point, uh, then we'll give the, the entire island's uh, DNC votes for, for DNC chair. He was currently running against Keith Ellison at the time. Ellison later reached out to Luis Gutierrez and said, hey, can you help me, you know, connect me to some people on the island? Gutierrez reached out and found out, whoa, <laughs> there's been a coup. All of our people have, have been tossed off. All of these folks are now with Perez. The DNC, for very good reasons, had never in the past come out with a position on, on statehood. And Perez waited about six months uh, after uh, he won the DNC chair race until he officially uh, came out on, be on behalf of, of statehood. And it was actually uh, him coming out for statehood that was criticized by a former New York City uh, councilwoman who was then called a puta uh, in these uh, telegram text messages. Uh, by, by Rosa Yo, and that, that was one of the, 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 the key things that people were objecting to when those, when those text messages came out. So in a, in a bizarre way, some of it uh, goes back to this strange uh, DNC coup that helped elevate Tom Perez uh, to become DNC chair. Over the more progressive candidate, Keith Ellison. Well, I want to thank you right. so much, Ryan Grimm, for being with us, Washington, D.C. bureau chief for The Intercept, edited and wrote the introduction to a volume titled The Mueller Papers, also the author of the new book, We've Got People, from Jesse Jackson to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, The End of Big Money and the Rise of a Movement. You can go to democracynow.org for the interview we did with him when the book came out. When we come back, we go to London, where thousands took to the streets yesterday to protest the new Prime Minister Boris Johnson. We'll be back in a minute. by the charlatans. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Boris Johnson was sworn in as the new British prime minister Wednesday, pledging to deliver a swift Brexit and spending his first full day in office Thursday, packing his cabinet with hard-line Brexiteers. Johnson addressed the House of Commons for the first time earlier today. ...is to deliver Brexit on the 31st of October for the purpose of uniting and re-energizing our great United Kingdom and making this country the greatest place on earth. Boris Johnson's election was the first time that a party's membership directly chose the prime minister. The membership of the Conservative Party, who voted for Johnson, represents less than 1 percent of the British population. Johnson, who previously served as mayor of London and foreign secretary, replaces outgoing prime minister Theresa May. Half of May's cabinet have resigned or been pushed out since Johnson was named prime minister. Boris Johnson's a highly contentious figure in the United Kingdom, who's built his career on controversy. He's a close ally of President Donald Trump, known for outrageous political gaffes. He's vowed to cut taxes for the rich and positioned himself as a friend to big banks. This is opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn addressing the House of Commons after Boris Johnson's initial remarks earlier today. No one underestimates this country, but the country is. But the country is deeply worried that the new Prime Minister overestimates himself. Yeah. He inherits a country that's been held back by nine years of austerity. That's hit children and young people the hardest. Their youth centres have closed. Their school funding cut. 
college budgets slashed, and with the help of the Liberal Democrats, tuition fees have trebled. Their housing costs are higher than ever. Their jobs are lower paid. Opportunity and freedom have been taken away. Austerity was always a political choice, never an economic necessity. People do not trust this Prime Minister to make the right choices for the majority of people in this country when he's also promising tax giveaways to the richest and big business, his own party's funders. So that's Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn. Boris Johnson's first day as prime minister was marked by major street protests. Thousands marched through central London despite a scorching heat wave. Activists from Greenpeace briefly blocked the new prime minister from reaching Buckingham Palace to meet with the Queen by forming a human chain in the path of his motorcade. The demonstration was quickly dispersed by police. Well, we're going to London now, where we're joined by Ash Sarker, senior editor at Navarra Media. She was in the streets of London at yesterday's protest. Ash, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Actually, it was Boris Johnson himself who said back in something like 2016 that he's more likely to be decapitated by a flying frisbee than to become prime minister of England. Uh, your response and what this all means for your country. Well, one can only hope about the uh, flying frisbee thing. But I think that that was a classic piece of Boris Johnson disingenuousness. He has very cannily crafted a public persona for himself, which is sort of bumbling, ineffectual, uh, posh but benign, whereas actually what that conceals is someone who has always been a very ambitious man. From when he was a little child, the first job that he ever wanted was to be world king. He then went to Eton, which is uh, one of the most prestigious private schools in the UK. Indeed, it's uh, produced prime ministers, which has governed for uh, 101 years of our parliamentary history. He then went to Oxford and was part of the Bullingdon Club, again, another engine for the elite. So he very much feels entitled to power simply because of uh, the circumstances of his birth, perhaps, rather than what he could actually do for the country. Well, Ash, as we mentioned, he was uh, uh, selected uh, by an infinitesimal uh, uh, percentage of Britain's population. And even among them, uh, Tory MPs, uh, I just want to quote a brief passage from The New Statesman, uh, where Martin Fletcher writes, Tory MPs have watched Johnson close up for years. They detest the man. They know perfectly well what a serially disloyal, untrustworthy, indolent, disorganized and egotistic charlatan he is. Can you explain why they nevertheless voted for him? Um, so the reason why... So the Tory selection process is a funny old beast, because first what happens is you have this sort of battle royale where all the candidates are voted on by the Conservative MPs, and it's whittled down to just two. And then those two go head to head in a vote which is carried out by the membership. The reason why Boris Johnson got as far as he did through the parliamentary vote, even though he is incredibly disliked by a sizable number of his own MPs, is because those MPs are very, very scared at the moment of the fact that their grassroots, so their core voters, but also their membership, haven't been voting Conservative, particularly in the last uh, European Parliament elections. They voted for the Brexit party. And they've also got another eye on Jeremy Corbyn, who is consistently either neck and neck with the Conservatives in the polls or indeed just by a couple of points uh, pipping them to first place. And they're thinking that they need someone who's got, um, you know, public recognisability in order to defeat Jeremy Corbyn. So that's how he made it that far. But in terms of why would they dislike him, well, you just have to look at his record. He was sacked as a journalist by The Times for making up quotes. He uh, then became mayor of London, in which he spent 
about a billion pounds on vanity projects, like the garden bridge, which never happened, like the water cannon, which was never used. As a foreign minister, he uh, stumbled from one gaffe to the next blunder. He made comments which endangered Nazanin Radcliffe Zaghari, who is still in an Iranian prison. Um, he's someone who time and again has shown a complete disregard for the standards that are set for those in public office. Conversely, that's why a lot of the conservative grassroots quite like him, because they see him as a maverick, someone who won't let the rules get in the way of getting something done. So he is coming to power right now at an absolutely critical juncture. Um, you have the crisis with Iran, that it looks like the U.S. has now just ensnared Britain in. So they took Iran's tanker. Iran then took one of their tankers. The tension in this area in the Gulf is higher than it's been in years. He is in charge. And you have, of course, him announcing no-deal Brexit within 99 days. What does this mean on both parts? Well, if you look at the state of governmental departments, not just the Ministry of Defence, but you look at the Ministry of Education, you look at the Ministry of Justice, because of Brexit, where you've got a lot of ministerial churn, so you've got a high number of resignations and also sackings for other reasons, it meant that real work with those departments hasn't really been done. So I'm not a, a big fan of militarism by any stretch of the imagination, but one example is you look at the amount of investment in the Royal Navy. Of course, the Royal Navy is uh, the most significant bit of the armed forces for dealing with this uh, conflict with Iran. Um, in terms of Britain's military capability for, uh, you know, singing in tune with Donald Trump and ratcheting up tensions, we really can't put our money where our mouth is. Um, it certainly doesn't help that uh, our last defence secretary but one got sacked for leaking uh, highly confidential information from the National Security Council. And then his uh, replacement, Penny Mordaunt, uh, was only in place for... Uh, 85 days, I think it was, uh, before she had to resign because of Boris Johnson coming in. So there is a huge amount of governmental dysfunction across every layer of uh, the government, across every single department. And then you go to this business of a no-deal Brexit. So Boris Johnson is still insisting that he wants to get a deal from the European Union. He's got a couple of problems in that regard, which is, one, the European Union have said that his idea of a deal is completely anathema to them. They will not countenance it. Two, if he tries to come back with the same deal that Theresa May was able to negotiate and it was defeated three times, his own backbenchers will be up in arms about it. And problem number three is he's in fact inherited a much weaker parliamentary majority than his predecessor Theresa May. The fact is, is that Theresa May is no longer prime minister because she lost her majority in 2017. And it meant that she had to endure defeat after defeat on her flagship piece of legislation. Now, because of external factors, including a conservative MP being uh, convicted of expenses fraud and another conservative MP who uh, is currently being charged with three counts of sexual assault, Boris Johnson's majority is even slimmer. So he's going to be in quite dire straits. Well, can he be forced, Ash, to call a, a, a general, an early general election? Well, the mechanism for that happening, because of something called the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, which really is a dreadful piece of legislation which has been specifically designed to prop up weak governments. It means that there would have to be a specifically worded motion of no confidence in the government. And if that motion of no confidence was passed by a simple majority, which means uh, half the MPs plus one, then there would be 14 days in which uh, someone else could form a different government. If that doesn't happen, then we go to a general election. The other method through which you can have an early general election is by a two-thirds majority of uh, the House of Commons. Now, I have a feeling that Boris Johnson is looking at his options quite carefully. And rather than being forced into a general election 
by a motion that's uh, put forward by one of the opposition parties, he just might go for an early general election himself. Mm. Ash Sarkar, senior editor at Navarra Media, we want to thank you for being with us. We're going to do part two with you to talk about taxing the rich, also what would happen with the Welsh election in August, what would this mean for the prime ministership and more. Go to democracynow.org for part two in our web exclusives. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Dean Augusto, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Ravi Karen, Hani Masood, Trina Durate Maria Studio and Libby Rainey. Uh, we have a job opening. Um, it is a video news fellowship, a video news production fellowship. Go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks so much for joining us.